Voice and Speech Diversities in Voice Training My name is Paul DeYoung and this video is titled Diversities in Voice Training. I serve as the Program Coordinator and Head of Voice for the Theatre Performance Program at the Humber College Institute for Technology and Advanced Learning. The issue of diversity is perhaps felt most keenly in the voice studio as it is the voice which reveals, in the most intimate and immediate of ways, the identity and difference of the speaker. This short video will introduce you to a few of the key issues that I struggled with when dealing with diversity in the voice studio. It will argue that the predominant approach to voice training in North America, one which revolves around a discourse of the free and natural voice, is not always adequate in addressing the issues of diversity. It will present some alternative strategies that regard the voice as distinctly social, cultural, and relational. It will propose that the act of speaking can be grounded in the immediate act of perceiving the other, an act which requires us to negotiate the uncomfortable acoustic turbulence found in a diverse and intercultural world. In conclusion, it will look at how these revised notions of the voice perhaps necessitate a different discourse in training. It is my hope that some of these insights will contribute to the growing field of knowledge about diversity in contemporary theatre practice. But since this is merely an introduction to a very large topic, please make sure to look at the questions and references that accompany this video on the website. Let us first take a look at the issue of diversity as it pertains to how speech is taught. For years, my practice followed the same prescriptive approach that I learned when I myself was in school. I was taught a standard of good speech. In England, this standard was received pronunciation, a neutral accent that was said to be devoid of individual idiosyncrasies and regional abnormalities, and could therefore be understood by the most people. In the United States, this standard was prescribed by Edith Skinner in her book Speak with Distinction, and combined qualities of received pronunciation with the sounds of the American Midwest. This standard made its way into Canadian theatre training institutions and has been present in them to this very day. The supposed aim of this career speech is to ensure that the audience, with its cultural and linguistic diversity, can understand what is being said. It is speech that is devoid of personal mannerisms, idiosyncrasies, and regionalisms that might make the ear of the listener uncomfortable. While we may not be as pedantic as we used to be about this neutral speech, its presence in our training institutions is still felt. Many years ago, I had the privilege of teaching at the Centre for Indigenous Theatre in Toronto. During that time, I got very busy with helping students to speak more clearly, to speak with a major tune travelling over the top of the phrase and down so that they could land their thoughts with authority, to open up their vowel range so that they could access their full emotional palate, to clearly articulate the ends of words with intellectual rigour, to find the stress-unstress heartbeat rhythm of the English language. When I was done with this admirable work, I remember two of my third-year students proclaiming, Great! Now I sound white! And, Great! Now I sound white! I was astounded. What I had done was unwittingly ignored their sound. I had regarded their modes of speech communication as idiosyncratic socio-cultural habits to be dispensed with in the search for that clear, neutral sound. And I began to realize that my approach disadvantaged anyone who came to the work embodying some kind of difference. The gay man who told me that he was tired of being asked to sound straight. The woman from Wawa who didn't want to sound like she was from the big city. The young man with a degenerative disease whose vocal and communicative reality was such that he could only speak in short gasps. I was ignoring their fundamental felt experience of what it was to communicate with their voices. I was ignoring their otherness, the very things that made their voice and speech unique and connected them with the world around them. So what was it about my own approach that led me into this quandary? 
What was the ideology behind my practice that excluded and minoritized these people? It was easy enough to challenge the prescriptive way in which I was teaching speech, but what I began to realize was that the problems ran deeper. It actually had to do with how I was approaching the voice work. Now, my approach to training was grounded in the work of Cicely Berry, Patsy Rodenberg, and Kristen Linklater, voice practitioners whose work sought to democratize theater and free it from the classism and elitism of previous decades. Their approach is unified in that they seek to free the voice from environmental and socio-cultural conditioning so that it can respond naturally and instinctually to the inner impulses of the speaker. That their profound work released us from the restrictions of the past and propelled us into a more democratic future cannot be underestimated. But it needs to be noted that this approach carries with it a set of ideological assumptions which may not necessarily support vocal diversity in the studio, assumptions which I had wholeheartedly accepted. Inherent in this approach is the discourse of the free and the natural voice, a discourse which works well in response to the predominant mode of psychological realism in Western theatre. The ideology behind this discourse levels the playing field in a sense, and allows actors from all walks of life to unearth and discover their individual and universal truth. But by proclaiming the ideology of the individual and the universal, are we at risk of losing the importance of the voice as being historically, environmentally, socially, and culturally formed? Is it really true that these environmental, socio-cultural habits that we so often regard as negative contractions to be freed from are so bad? What had I lost in this striving for a natural and free sound? Is it possible that I was throwing out cultural and other kinds of difference in my attempt to find the universal? Added to this is an approach to voice work that privileges anatomical exploration over other kinds of exploration, in the belief that the anatomy of the voice and the understanding of that anatomy are universal and the same the world over. But is this actually true? Can I honestly say that I understand my body and its vocal anatomy in the same way that someone from Pakistan does? Or someone who is transgender? or bound to a wheelchair? Of course not. Who we are and how we have been shaped and molded by the world around us determines our felt experiences of ourselves and how we think about and use our voice. To regard these environmental and socio-cultural experiences as contractions or areas of tension from which we must free ourselves anatomically in order to release our voice democratizes the voice to the point that our inherent diversity can be lost. So is there another way of working? What if we were to engage with a positive exploration of these social, cultural, and environmental influences? Could we begin to uncover and celebrate the differences that set us apart by engaging with each individual's embodied experience of what it means to communicate with the voice? The first hurdle for me was to recognize that no teaching is devoid of ideology. Whenever we teach, we are teaching a theory of how we think things ought to be. We are teaching from an ideological base. Therefore, it is necessary to allow practice to inform theory and theory to inform practice, recognizing that the two always work in tandem. Tara McAllister Veal suggests, and I quote, that we begin training with the assumption that socio-cultural and, and environmental influences prepare the body voice with certain skills necessary for discipline-specific actor training. If we take her advice, we could establish these influences, however loosely we want to define them, as the primary foundations for voice pedagogy instead of dispensing with them at the outset. Several years ago, the Theatre Performance Program at Humber College implemented a socio-cultural project into its first-year curriculum. The goal of the project was to give students an opportunity to investigate the environmental and socio-cultural history of their voice. We defined this history very broadly to mean anything that had an influence on their voice and speech as they grew up. 
we proposed that our geographical, environmental, social, and cultural roots, along with the languages we spoke or heard, were the building blocks of how we think, behave, and communicate. They set our own personal rhythm and influence the way we sound and work with language. They form the foundation for how we communicate with the world around us. We asked students to find a piece of text that reflected their cultural, social, linguistic, and geographical origins, something that they knew from their youth, perhaps a story or a poem that their family or community used to tell them, or a piece of text which somehow gave voice to the ancestry, culture, and geography they grew up in. If they had a first language other than English, the text could be in that language. If they came from a different language background but didn't know how to speak the language, they could find a text in both the original language and in the translation and play with that. If they came from mixed backgrounds, they could choose the one which they felt had the strongest impact on them and find text based on that. Now, as they began to speak the texts to each other, I asked them to explore the physical manifestations of society, culture, geography, environment, and ancestry within their patterns of voice and speech communication, not as negative influences, but as elements which shaped and molded their vocal actions. I asked them to explore their bodies and voices as the location of a dynamic interplay of forces, forces which vacillated between tension and release, and resulted in the voice and forms of speech communication that were uniquely theirs. In getting them to do this, I was asking them to discover what Roland Barthes calls the grain of their sound, the so-called dirty sound that characterizes any instrument and makes it unique, like a cello or a bassoon. In this way, the students were taking part in a form of social training, discovering the dirty, relational aspects of their voice that were previously left unexplored. On hearing each other perform, the students were introduced to the vast possibilities for speech and voice communication, and how each person's voice contained a diversity of influences that made it unique. They began to think about the voice as relational, something that is constantly being shaped, formed, and transformed by the world around it. In this way, they stopped thinking about their voice as a collection of bad environmental and socio-cultural habits to be freed from in the search for universal truth. Instead, they started to respect it as an ever-evolving expression of their unique relationship to the world, and began playing with the dynamic cycles of tension and release inherent in them. Working with them further, I began to talk about the voice not just as something that reveals inner natural impulse and image, but as the voice they use to create an impulse or image between them and the other, and by other I mean other people acknowledged and heard in all their singularity and difference. Here then, the voice is defined by its relationality, the degree to which it searches out, moves and affects the unique other in the co-creation of an image. Now it was here that some very interesting vocal transformations began to occur. The act of sounding out the other allowed for a kind of vulnerability and diversity that I had not heard before. Speech and intonation became a vocal tactic that was used to influence the other, but one which operated according to its own distinct history and communicative rationality, its inherent diversity. Working in this way lent itself well to devised approaches to post-dramatic performance, a very different kind of aesthetic, where diverse voices could contend and collide with each other to create meaning in the acoustic space between the actors and between the actors and the audience. This approach to performance privileges the immediacy of action in relationship to the evolving whole, and it gives the actor a different kind of agency with a voice that may not always necessarily be found in dramatic approaches that focus on the representation of character. It is an approach which encourages and supports the turbulence of diversity in an intercultural world. It plays with the diverse materiality of sound in such a way that intercultural tensions can be foregrounded to tell the story.